grim and dismal sight greeted people outside McDonald House. Three people were killed in that bomb blast. 36 others were injured. Many have not forgotten the incident. It was a lucky escape for me. Had I not been called back to the office, I would have been seriously injured in the lift or even outside the lift because all the glass sprinters came down. It was very bad. I found Paul Mutu, who was a lift operator. He was lying underneath a beam which had fallen down from the lift shaft because the lift came straight the way down. So I tried to get him out, but uh, I couldn't because the wing was too heavy and I kept calling for people to come and help me and they're saying, no, no, we'll get electrified. And I said, well, I'm not being electrocuted, so why can't you help? And I couldn't get anybody to help me and eventually, thank goodness, the fire brigade came along and um, they got the poor chap out. It was full of debris, I could hardly see in front. And uh, when I came out of the building, I saw the, the sort of uh, a lot of confusion all over the place. And uh, sort of uh, even the uh, windows of the building outside was smashed. The, the glass the windows were smashed, you see. For Reverend Yoswan Kim, surviving the explosion was a miracle. But scars from that incident are still there. When there had been sporadic explosions in other places carried out by saboteurs. It was the Indonesian confrontation against Malaysia. President Sukarno had launched his campaign of Ganyang Malaysia or Crush Malaysia in 1963, but the reasons for confrontation have never really been fully understood. President Sukarno was suspicious and contemptuous of the peaceful manner in which Malaya had been granted independence by the British. That experience had differed radically from the violent revolution that gave rise to the modern Indonesia he helped found. The creation of Malaysia comprising Malaya, Singapore, Sarawak and Sabah was seen by him as a neo-colonialist plot and a challenge to Indonesia's position of dominance in the region. Confrontation was also a means by which attention could be diverted from problems at home. At the beginning, confrontation took the form of political agitation and economic sanctions against Malaysia. Then, low-key military operations were launched. Indonesian soldiers infiltrated into West Malaysia, Singapore, Sabah and Sarawak to carry out random acts of terrorism. Here at Pasi Panjang and several other quiet stretches of beach, the saboteurs landed under cover of darkness. Their mission, to dampen the people's morale by carrying out acts of sabotage. But not all the saboteurs were successful in the attempts. Many were caught before they could carry out the missions. All over Singapore, a volunteer group, the Vigilante Corps, kept watch at night. Their duty was to look out for suspicious looking people and parcels. Whatever we suspect any parcel or not, we dare not to do anything. We better make sure what type, of, whether it is round, flat, whatever it is. If it is flat, we ignore it, we know it. The bomb will be flat at least around, or hand grenade, some side like a tennis ball. We know how they bundle it. But if we really suspect, we have already instru been instructed to inform the police, don't touch. So we round all these places where it's necessary, especially near the residence area. 
like a Daman Road, all that, you know, Wilkinson Road, that we have to go around to make sure that their life is still secured when the VCs are around. Exhibitions were organized to educate people about confrontation. Singaporeans were warned not to handle any suspicious looking parcels and bomb drills were also taught to counter the acts of terrorism. The 1st and 2nd Singapore Infantry Regiments, which were part of the Malaysian Armed Forces, were sent to the jungles of East and West Malaysia to patrol areas which were infiltrated by Indonesian troops. The low-key military incursions and the acts of sabotage did not seriously affect the morale of the people in Singapore. The cut in Indonesia-Singapore trade, however, did cause some inconvenience and hardship. For those who depended on entrepreneur trade for a living, the economic sanctions meant a drop in earnings and even unemployment. In response, the government sped up the growth of the manufacturing sector to make the economy less dependent on entrepreneur trade. But still, Singapore had to live with the Indonesian confrontation for another year before it was brought to an end. At the time of Singapore's independence, drastic political changes were taking place in Indonesia. The Communist Party of Indonesia, PKI, made a bid to capture power through a coup. Six Indonesian generals were murdered, but the coup failed. The retaliation by the army was swift. The ranks of the PKI were virtually wiped out. The unsuccessful coup also led to Sukarno's downfall. A new political leadership under General Suharto began to disengage Indonesia from the policy of confrontation. Attention was turned instead to addressing the serious problems of the Indonesian economy, which was near collapse. Trade between a newly independent Singapore and Indonesia was resumed. A year later, diplomatic ties were restored. And in August 1967, the governments of Southeast Asian countries decided to form ASEAN to enhance regional cooperation. Confrontation had highlighted the fragility of regional relations. It was realized that political turbulence could only be avoided if there is mutual respect and cooperation. And for Singapore, Confrontation was also a learning experience. First fact is that we are alone now. Unlike before, we, the British looked after our defence. Today, we have to look after ourselves. Well, for a small country, the best defence is deterrence. That means there are limits to our defence capacity, but whoever attacks us will also pay a heavy price. Second is inner strength. There must be cohesiveness so people will realize that when you attack, you're meeting a united community. The other factor is economic strength. In case of a conflict, the enemy would work on the basis where their economic resources are limited. Just sit tight, wear them out. So preparedness, therefore, political preparedness, economic preparedness, and military preparedness are essential 